Okay. So while we're waiting for more people to get on, um, I just want to share an, uh, an item about uh, my wardrobe for tonight. Um, it's, uh, and I'm going to stand up. So we're talking about heirlooms. And this sweater was, uh, it's an Afghan squares. I don't know for the knitters in the group. They are Afghan squares and it was made by my mother um, as part of my college wardrobe. And just to give you an idea, and it's an heirloom. And just to give you an idea, um, I went to college in 1963. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I will take it off shortly because it's warm, it's hot, um, but I thought it would be fun to wear. Uh, it's, it's an heirloom and it's something that many of us have heirlooms around our home. So good evening and welcome to the fifth presentation uh, in our How to Live Forever series. Uh, my name is Corey Schneider and I am so very excited to be with you. As Archives Chair for Women's League, my goal is not only to tell Women's League's story, but to also hope, help you tell yours. Before we begin, I want to let you know we will be recording the session, and uh, you had to know that when you signed on. Uh, if you don't want to be seen, please turn off your video, and if you don't want your name to show, please change it. Uh, everyone is muted uh, to avoid unwanted background noise. Uh, we are also disabling the chat during the presentation, but we'll turn it on at the end so you can put your questions in the chat box. And of course, you can contact me anytime and you will get my information in follow-up emails and any other, any other uh, contact that I have with you via email. Um, I want to give uh, a special welcome from Debbie Goldich. Debbie is not here this evening because she is right now in Los Angeles uh, getting ready to go to a gala to raise funds for the, uh, rabbinic, uh, the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. So she's very excited to be there and we've given her an excuse uh, not to be here, uh, but she wanted to let you know that she's very much uh, looking forward to looking at the video. I also want to give a shout out to Ellen Bresnick and Julia Loeb, who are our co-chairs of education. And this series is done in cooperation with the education department. Many, many thanks to Sheila Kaufman for her tech support. Thank you, Sheila. And to Carol Simon, who will be handling the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and to Renee Ravitch, who agreed to sit in if Carol couldn't make it because she wasn't quite sure she was going to be here. Um, so Sheila, let's start with the PowerPoint, the first slide. And we're going to share screen. I'm taking my, my heirloom sweater off because it's very warm. And... I'm waiting for the screen to share. The share, yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, and let's do a full screen on the slide. There you go. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Um, so here's our agenda for tonight. <clears throat> what heirlooms are and why they're important, which to pass on and which not, the stories. And those of you who have, have been part of the series know how important the stories are and how much I work on the stories. Preserving, storing and digitizing heirlooms, tips for passing them on and who to pass them to, how to create your own with lots of wonderful Judaic heirlooms. And I'm excited to present these to you. And then of course, uh, question and answers at the end. So what is an heirloom? An heirloom, next slide, please. An heirloom, Sheila, next slide, please. Are we having, okay. Let's wait until we get the next slide. 
Sorry, it's it's going. Okay, that's fine. Hmm. There we go. There we go. Um, so an heirloom is a very special thing that's handed down sometimes through a will, but often just from person to person. Imagine someday, decades from now, what do you want future generations to remember about you? The importance of family heirlooms. Now more than ever, people want to learn about their family history. People spend hundreds of dollars buying DNA kits to give them additional information about where they came from. Another way to learn about your family history is by studying your family heirlooms. Heirlooms hope help to create a legacy. Parents and grandparents want to leave future generations with memorable items before they pass on. And family heirlooms make sure that your family's legacy stands the test of time. It connects us to past generations. Heirlooms can bring past generations into the present, tell the stories about a person who has passed on, and reinforce, reinforce the emotional component. Families are amazed to see an item from the 19th century be passed down to someone in 2021. Interesting conversation pieces that help keep family members alive. Almost everyone finds family heirlooms, excuse me. Guys, guys, please. I, I gotta, I have to tell my family to be quiet. Almost everyone finds family heirlooms fascinating and provide the opportunity to just share a piece of your family's story. Not only will this help keep your family member's memory alive, but it may also inspire someone else to start collecting heirlooms of their own. The legacy you leave can be as unique as the life you're living. Much more than leaving money or property to your heirs, bequeathing is about determining how you want to be remembered. Heirloom legacies come in all shapes and forms. Next slide, please. It could be the boning knife your husband's father, the butcher, used, the Torah binder donated in memory of your great-grandfather and found in a drawer after your aunt died, the China cocoa set on loan to mom but never requested back, your children's favorite toy made by the husband of their babysitter, your mother's grandmother's washboard, your grandfather's menorah, or the diamond cocktail ring with your husband's great grandmother's engagement diamond as the centerpiece. These are the heirlooms that really matter. Can you picture the ones you have? Passing down family heirlooms like these is how traditions are born. As we age, we often view our lives through the lens of those who came before us. Just passing on money or property can seem devoid of true meaning. To that end, we each seek treasured slices of our lives that we can pass down. What are the most popular heirlooms? Here's a list of them. Jewelry, timepieces, furniture, recipes, Letters, diaries, scrapbooks, and as I read the list, think about it. What do you have? Bibles and other books, military memorabilia, quilts, collections, family, home or land, wedding gowns and other vintage clothing, clothing cedar chests, hope chests, steamer trunks, musical instruments, photos, photo albums, wedding albums, yearbooks, weapons, kitchenware, Embroidered linens, art, stories, always the stories, and absolutely anything else. Let me just talk about some of them. Musical instruments are common heirloom candidates. Sound evokes strong sense memories, and it isn't so surprising 
that musical instruments, even those with little monetary value, are popular heirloom keepsakes. Clocks and timepieces, from grandfather and grandmother clocks to stone sundials, are almost a cliche when it comes to heirlooms. The timepieces themselves are a testament to the ingenuity and craftsmanship of past generations. Recipes. Oh, following, follow grandma's recipes and soon your kitchen will be filled with smells from years gone by. Heirlooms related to food and meals can carry powerful memories with them. There's nothing quite so touching as owning a mother or grandmother's recipe, especially a handwritten one, and knowing that the chocolate smudge you see in the corner was made by her very hand. If you've ever loved to cook, her recipes are priceless. Photos and documents. We talked a lot about pictures and documents in the last session. They are powerful memory keepers. If you missed the session, please feel free to watch the video available on the Women's League website. And don't forget your own COVID-19 vaccination card. It will be treasured by future generations as much as you're now, you now treasure the naturalization papers and ship manifests you have from your family. Quilts. They are uniquely American art form. And quilting has become hugely popular in recent years. If you've ever dressed up in a quilt and imagined yourself a queen with a royal cape to match, that imagination inspiring quilt is priceless to you. Jewelry. You may be thinking of your grandmother's heirloom engagement ring, but rings aren't the only popular heirloom jewelry items. Cameos, hairpins, hat pins, brooches, pearl necklaces, earrings, and cufflinks. Well, the list goes on and on. Jewelry is valuable but it also comes in contact with the body. So there's an almost intimate connection with another person. If that person is dear to you, the object has enormous value apart from its monetary worth. And of course, absolutely everything and anything else. This in fact, a never ending list. So, hmm. What's the difference between heirlooms and junk? Junk is anything that your family won't value. Currently, the 10 least wanted heirlooms are, and don't ask me why this is so, brown furniture, china, crystal, silver plate serveware, table linens, collectible figurines, collectible tea sets, chafing dishes and large serving ware, pianos, grandfather's clocks. However, one person's junk could be another person's family history treasure. The most important to, question to ask when you are deciding whether or not to keep something is, if you had this item from your ancestors, would this be meaningful to you? Keep these items whenever the answer is yes to this question and always ask the question, whether it is a photo, document, jewelry, artifact, anything. Be sure to talk to with family members about what they consider is an heirloom. Anything can be an heirloom to a future descendant with an interest in the item. So other questions that might be helpful. Why do you want future generations to keep this? Focus on three to four generations from now. What is the legacy you are trying to preserve? If something is more important to you than you think it will be to the future generations, you can keep them in a to throw or give away when I pass box to make things easier when the time comes. 
and be prepared for strong emotion, emotions when sorting through your family's treasures. What preserves the personality of the person? When deciding what to keep or toss, look at items that preserve a personality and how to capture it best. Also ask, what will you lose if this item is discarded? Who is the correct person to inherit this? Photos, documents, and heirlooms related to siblings, cousins, or friends are better passed down to their descendants. What can I organize and explain now? A well-organized history with notations, photos, stories, and context is more likely to be preserved and valued than otherwise. What is a digestible scope of, and size of the history you want passed down? Make sure the items you organize are appropriate for future generations. Curate your own most, of, most valuable items. Who will best preserve my history? Are there particular family members, even distant ones, who would appreciate it best? Are there family members with particular interests who will resonate with a certain aspect of your history? Carefully think about how you can preserve your history in a way that the current generations aren't burdened with it now, but there is enough for later generations to enjoy. Reduce the size if possible. For instance, take that 10 pound wedding album, that big, and many of us have them, that big wedding album of yours or your parents, and reduce it down to a half pound photo book. Tell the story. And I harp on this every presentation that I've been giving. Tell the story. Without it, the heirloom might be considered junk. Family heirlooms are often not worth as much as the story that goes along with them. The stories are what keep family histories alive. Develop a sense of understanding and establish lasting family traditions. These battered sterling civil candlesticks would probably be melted down for silver by future generations. Unless my ancestors, my, my future generations knew that they were used by my grandmother who brought them with her from Europe, then my mother and then me to welcome every Shabbat and Yom Tov. During sessions two and three of these three of these ser this series, Ellen Bresnick and Julia Love, Women's League Education Co-Chairs, shared information on how you can tell the stories and write the memoirs. The videos of these sessions are also available on the Women's League website. website. Remember, if it's not written down, taped or videotaped, the story will not continue to exist. You think it might because you told your kids or your grandkids, mm. but if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. To tell the stories of these heirlooms, answer the following questions. What is the name of the item? When did you acquire it? How? When and how have you used it? Who else has owned it before you? Who do you want to give it to when you no longer need it? Why do you want this person to receive it? What other memories do you have of this item? And what memories do you have of the people who owned this before you? These are a lot of questions for some of which you may not have answers. Most of our forebears didn't think to inventory their everyday belongings. After all, you ready for this? Hair receivers? Stock, sock darners, and you can see a sock darner at the top right of this slide, and bed warming pans were about as exciting to them as curling irons and electric blankets are to us. But these objects can tell us a lot about our, how our ancestors live. Start investigating the stories behind your family treasures 
and how to pre preserve those treasures for future generations. Ask relatives about the keepsake. Study the ob object's size, shape, color, and material subject, substance. Guess what the object might be? I don't know how many of you knew that that top right picture is of a sock darner. For instance, the sock darner was placed inside the sock to provide a hard surface where the area of the hole in the sock was. This made it easier to sew and so you didn't prick your hand with the needle. Look for a patent date and number. The date can clue you in to which ancestor originally owned the item. Hit the books, hit the Google, look up the item. There are many guides available and old catalogs are great since they contain pictures and original prices. Oh my gosh, that's Sears catalog, the old ones. Keep the heirloom in tip top shape. Handle the item carefully. Record again, record the keepsake story. After all your detective work, don't forget to record what you've learned. Create an inventory of heirlooms. What are some ways to help make sure the story gets told? Photo book. And you can see uh, our family heirlooms. I did a dummy page of what might be a photo book. Index, index cards with uh, index card file with pictures. And um, the picture of that piece of uh, an old um, ceramic pot was in a found in a uh, dig in Israel. But there's a story behind that. That belongs to me. And the story behind it is one that I started to tell at the beginning of this session uh, about when my son David was injured. And there's that story on that card. Anybody interested in it? Let me know after the session and I'll tell you. Um, attach information to the item safely and securely, perhaps on the back of frames, inside dishes, clipped using plastic because metal paper clips, mm -mm, they'll rust out and ruin your item. Make sure to present the story each time you give away an item. Designate a person in charge of making sure the story goes with the item when you're gone. And in, in my particular case, um, I have a file box of index cards, each one with a picture of the item and the story on the card. And I've instructed my son, my oldest son, who is the executive of our, of our estate, to give away the card with the item when I'm no longer around to do so. Remember, of course, any heirloom is only as valuable as the story that comes with it. With each recounting, history turns into memory and memory into history. If nothing matters, then there is nothing to, serve, to save. And that's from what I want you to know, we're still here by Esther Safran Boyer. So how do we preserve, store, and digitize our heirlooms? Well, for preservation, Stan, Stan, please. Thank you. We have to, we have to, you know, get a bit quiet in here. Family heirlooms are a great treasure, but can be easily damaged by light, heat, humidity, pests, and handling. There are a few basic things you can do to preserve these airline hair heirlooms for future generations. If you feel you must display fragile items, then try to avoid dampness, too much heat and dramatic changes in temperature and humidity. If you feel comfortable, your treasures probably will too. Display and store your family heirlooms away from heat sources, outside walls, basements, and attics where most of us probably keep our heirlooms that we don't display or use. And shun the light. Sunlight and fluorescent light fade and discolor most treasures and are especially dangerous to fabrics, paper, and photographs. Place framed or displayed treasures on or near walls that get the least amount of sun. Rotate items between display and storage to provide a rest from exposure and prolong their life. Watch out for pests. Holes in furniture or textiles, wood shavings, and tiny droppings, yuck are all evidence of bug or rodent visitation. 
Consult a conservator if you spot trouble. And of course, we have heirloom allergies. Historic objects can be harmed by abrasive cleaners, dry cleaners bags, glues, adhesive tapes and labels, pins, staples, and paper clips, acidic wood, cardboard or paper, and pens and markers. And as I list, listed those, think of all the things that you value as an heirloom or as, a, as a, an item that tells about your history that are subject to some of those heirloom allergies. So even it is, if it is broken, think twice before you fix it. A smudged painting, torn photograph, or broken vase may seem easy to fix. They aren't. Well-intended amateur repairs often do more harm than good. Consult a conservator for advice, for advice on valued items. Some items are not so valued, it's okay. But for those that you really value, and value is not necessarily uh, connected to the, the financial value of an item, but to the, the, the sentimental and, and value of an item. Let me just say a few words about textiles. If you must wear antique textiles, be very careful of spills and don't use makeup or antiperspirants. And of course, you saw my, my, my textile, my, this wooden, wooden woolen sweater that my mother made me when I went to college. Store folded textiles in acid-free boxes with unbuffered tissue or white sheeting between the layers. Inspect stored textiles regularly. Do not store with pesticides, surprising, or mothballs. If textiles are hung, Use well-padded plastic, not wooden hangers that are as wide as a garment's shoulders. Sturdy fabrics may be cleaned by vacuuming on low suction with the brush attachment covered with cotton cheesecloth. What about digitizing physical memorabilia? Perhaps we cannot clone physical items such as family heirlooms, such as that wedding dress or such as that sweater but we can convert them to a digital form that at least makes them easier to share with others and preserves the digital memory of them in the case of physical destruction or loss. Create that heirloom index or photo book. So how do we pass down heirlooms and to who? When making up wills, a lots of people forget about the stuff that counts the pieces of sentimental value. As tricky as dealing with money matters can be, dealing with feelings can even be harder. You wanna approach the designation of family heirlooms with caution, sensitivity, and perhaps most importantly, forethought. This process, and it can really be a process, everyone. is one you want to start early. First decide if it is an heirloom or junk. We've already talked about that. Second, who wants it? Does someone want it? If you have a relative who has expressed interest in a particular heirloom, that's probably where it should go. Another consideration is emotional attachment, either to the heirloom, perhaps it lived in someone's childhood bedroom, or to this descendant who passed it down, who was closest to grandpa. If no one stands out as the obvious designee, or much hairier, more than one person stands out, you have some potentially difficult decisions to make. Who gets it? A basic guideline for designating heirlooms is to keep it along family lines. If both your daughter and daughter-in-law want an item, say the dining room set built by your uncle, it goes to your daughter. Even if your daughter-in-law wants it more, your daughter has been in the family a lot longer. If it's your son who has expressed interest in it, it's not so easy. In that case, you can either take a guess at who wants it more designate the dining set to your son and another heirloom of similar value, and that's monetary 
and or sentimental value to your daughter. Or better yet, ask them. You may find that one of them was just being polite. Here are some ways to think about who gets what. Enjoy playing mahjong or chess with your daughter. Bequeath your set to her. Share a taste for gourmet cooking with your niece or nephew. Leave him or her your set of copper kitchenware. Have a lo loved one who enjoys traveling just as you did. They might treasure mementos from your travels. Which brings us to the final major decision. When do you want them to find out what they've won? How will they know? Put it in your will, and then you don't need to, need to deal with any fuss. And when your wishes are in writing, they're hard to disregard. That might be more difficult for your descendants though. To potentially avoid hurt feelings, arguments, and impossible choices, get everyone together so that they can claim what they want. Take turns with colored yard sale stickers. Each immediate family member claiming an item in turn is a possible way to do this. This takes grief out of the occasion. What my mom did was to designate certain things to those she definitely wanted them to have. The rest, she did a round robin. What no one wanted was sold or given away. The money from the sale was split between those in the round robin. It worked and there were no hard feelings. Oh, if you simply can't bring yourself to choose who gets what, donate it. That way, at least your kids will be mad at you and not at each other. We all have collections, even if we don't think so. Look around, you'll see them in your home. So what can you do with them? On the top left is my mom's collection of antique silverware pieces. She made into a lovely display using a shadow, bo shadow box and some creative effort. Do you have a cedar chest filled full of antique linens? If you're a crafty, you can refashion them into useful keepsake memories or have someone do it for you. And what about those t-shirts? How about a t-shirt quilt? Frame some of the vintage jewelry pieces to make fun creative art for someone's wall, especially if you wore the piece often. They will think of you every time they pass it by or frame your mother's jewelry collection complete with her picture. And I love that center bottom picture. Medals can be framed and hung on the wall to serve as a source of pride for generations to come. Use handwritten recipe cards and transform them into any number of items, mugs, tea towels, or professionally bound hardcover books. Frame your collection of Torah funds. And in the top right, you see my collection. In mine, I needle pointed the background and put a description of all the pins in a pocket on the back of the frame. I was recently as a, at an arts and crafts show and found a vendor who turned vintage buttons, and you can see them on the top left, and cameos into fashionable pendants, bracelets, and rings. You can even turn watches that no longer work into a nice bracelet. Family photos can be inserted in the face of the watch, much like an open locket. He did a wonderful job, and on the resource uh, materials that, that you may request after the session, I will send you the name of that particular vendor. Now let's talk a bit about recipes. Some of the best memories parents and children have are from being gathered together around the dinner table. Gifting your child or grandchildren with a family recipe or a well-loved cookbook. In the top left, is the settlement cookbook given to my mother by my father for her birthday a month after they were married. Is there a, a, is there a message there? The, the inscription, if I remember correctly, is my dad wrote to a good cook who constantly wants to improve. I think there definitely is a message. Or a cookbook of your family's recipes is a wonderful heirloom to pass on. 
If you wanna do a family cookbook, there are hundreds of vendors who will print it for you. <coughs> Excuse me, or you can do a photo book with recipes. I have included these guidelines for creating your family recipe book on the heirlooms resource sheet you can request on the Google survey you will receive next week. The steps are to gather recipes and use, as I said before, use handwritten recipes when possible. Make your book in uniquely yours with pictures and quotes and notes. Find old photos of the family around the table or grandma cooking dinner. Include memories. Tell the story and traditions behind each recipe. A few words to a few paragraphs. For instance, I learned how to make horseradish and I have his recipe from my brother-in-law on my first trip to meet Stan's family in Maine. He was sitting on his porch, grinding horseradish and of course, crying. Who is known for the recipe? <clears throat> Use clip art and quotes on almost every page. <coughs> Write a memorable introduction, something relevant to your family. Include a small list of hints at the end. You can produce the books on your computer, duplicate, bind, and distribute, or use a photo or a photo book and or use a vendor. Want to start an heirloom tradition at your house? Great times and well-loved belongings make good raw material. The objects don't have to be expensive, but if you make them part of a holiday tradition, important celebration, or give them pride of place on a mantle or table, they may become priceless to your children. Start a scrapbook or begin collecting something as a family, like buttons, stamps, or frogs. How many of us have frogs we've used at, at the Passover Seder that become heirlooms? These are heirlooms in the making. Creating your own heirlooms. I am very excited to present some ideas for Judaic heirlooms that have been created. With many thanks to the wonderful women who have shared their stories with me. If you want more information on any of them, I will send you pictures and contact information of the women who created them. These following tonight's presentation. I met Heike Hoffman as a member of a Facebook book, Needlepoint Nation. And for any of you who are needlepointers, this is a fabulous Facebook group with magnificent skill. You should join up, it doesn't cost anything, it's a Facebook group. Heike shared her creating heirlooms journey with me. And I believe Heike's on tonight and I welcome her and thank her. She had done a bit of needlepoint when she was first married 40 years ago, but not much since. And then the pandemic hit and she had all this time on her hands when she and her husband retired and had to stop traveling. I am so pleased to show you just some of what she has accomplished in the last two years. Her goal is to create family heirlooms, family heirlooms that would be, will be used for generations to come. In addition to personal unique pieces for her now, each of her now 13 grandchildren, heirlooms that won't end up in a good, Goodwill store one day. And hopefully when she is long gone, will provide them with a smile when they think of the love put into it for just them. She also embroiders a message on each to help them feel her presence when they do use it. And you'll see the message on uh, one of her messages on the top left. First, this was a process that she used. First, she asked her daughters and daughters-in-law for ideas and involved her grandchildren when possible in the designing. All the grandsons got or will get when they're old enough to fill in bags and the granddaughters Sudor covers. Her next project was based on family tradition and I love this one. Heike's Bubby would give each granddaughter a special piece of jewelry on certain birthdays. Her mother continued this tradition with all of her granddaughters and Heike decided to do it with hers as well. In addition to the pieces of jewelry, she decided that on their 12th birthday, she would also present them 
with a needle pointed jewelry box. She gave each girl a choice of designs that she then drew and had a company put them in, onto canvas. The ones who were not old enough, the mothers chose. She also needle points dreidels and you can see those at the bottom right. She lets all the kids who are old enough choose their own and two of the girls, cause they're purchased as a kit. And two of the girls even got to put some stitches into theirs as she happened to be stitching them when she went to visit. She then asked her daughters and daughters-in-law what they would like. So far, they have requested a Shabbat prayer with over 100 words and challah covers. And I love the challah cover just laying on her young grand grandchild. As well as a Tanoyim plate holder. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, their family's custom when the engagement contract called Tanoyim is signed is for the mother and future mother-in-law to break a ceramic plate symbolizing the seriousness of the bride and groom's commitment to each other. Just as breaking the plate is final, so too the engagement is final and not easily terminated. And in fact, you need to get to break to know him. Heike added a piece of her actual wedding dress and a piece from one of her husband's kittles to the needlepoint. That was her favorite part. Her newest daughter-in-law requested a breed pillow and you see that in the top center. And I have had the pleasure over the years of making knitted kippot with the baby's name in Hebrew for him to wear as his Brit. It is a wonderful heirloom to say when enhanced by the story of the baby's birth. The most recent pictured, recent pictured here was made for Janet Kirshner's grandson just a month ago. Sharon Glass, Lila Frost's daughter, welcome Lila. Sharon can't be with us because she's in, in Israel visiting, visiting family, made wimples, Torah binders. A custom began in Germany generations ago for the mother of a baby boy with perhaps his sisters to make a Torah binder from, a swaddling, sw from the swaddling cloth used at the baby's brit milah. They would embroider it with various sayings, blessings, and Jewish symbols. Sharon knew that when she was blessed with the son, she would do that for him. So for 13 years, she collected the signed initials of all those relatives who were alive when he was born. Sharon included his birthday, his Torah portion, his name, and several symbols that related to him. It was used at his bar mitzvah before all who loved him, many who were no longer alive. It will be used again in a few months at his ufruf before his wedding very special. Her oldest daughter also liked the idea of the wimple. She saw at her brother's bar mitzvah. When her oldest daughter gave birth to a boy, her daughter was determined to do something similar. The back of the cloth of the wimple, and you'll see it on the bottom, is made of his much loved blankie from his infancy. The front has his name, a well-known known verse from his Torah portion, from Jacob's blessings to Ephraim and Manasseh, dates and symbols. <clears throat> the letters are filled in with bits of closing, and obviously this is not a, show, it's a picture of it not completed yet, but you can see the little bits of closing, clothing from family that hold meaning and memories of the family. A dear friend of ours gifted each of our sons a wimple for their bar mitzvahs. This one that our oldest has around his neck, he is ne that was at his bar mitzvah, before his bar mitzvah, he is now 53, was adorned with logos of places that played an important role in his life to that point. Ramah, the yeshiva day school, the synagogue. Back to Sharon, next slide. When her father died, she knew she wanted some of his ties. He loved his ties and loved sharing them and then seeing which ones his family liked best. 
share, I'm sorry, sharing them with families, friends, and relatives. He loved shopping for them and then seeing which ones his family liked best. Everyone knew about his ties. She wanted to make something out of them, but didn't know what. <clears throat> her daughter loved her grandpa. Sharon did some research and came up with the idea to make her daughter a chuppah from her father's ties. Although she wasn't seeing anyone at the time, that gave her the two years she needed to complete it. And she did just in time. That is one of the most unique chuppot I've ever seen. Esther Kaufman shared the story of her son's chuppah on the left and on the right. It is a chuppah made from 13 of the bride and groom's sentimental family items, including pieces of two linen tablecloths, two pairs of plaid pants, two white satin yarmulkes, a gold bathrobe, a lace wedding dress, and an elephant patterned teller cloth talus bag, to mention the few. It was created by a company called Chuppah Studio. Andrea Colby, wove two tali tote for her son's wedding just recently that were used as the chuppah and then given to her son and son-in-law to use as tali tote after the wedding. When she completed the weaving, they all tied the tzitzit together, thus all contributing to the creation of the tali tote. The tali tote were woven at my sisterhood's loom room where anyone can come and weave a Judaic heirloom or have one custom woven. What a wonderful heirloom. Tammy Arnowitz, the daughter-in-law of Janet Arnowitz who, and her husband, Rabbi Jeffrey Arnowitz, Tammy loved her wedding dress. It was everything she wanted it to be. After the wedding, she had the idea to repurpose or upcycle her wedding dress into a talit. The first attempt used the skirt to make the talit, but it was too fragile since the material used for the skirt of her dress was not really made to withstand weekly wear and tear. So she had a second talit made with lace, beads and sequins from the original fabric sewn onto a new, more durable fabric. Now, each week she wears a talit that literally wraps her in reminders of her wedding and the family that she and her husband, Jeffrey, Rabbi Jeffrey Arnowitz created, created. Both talitot were made by fabric artists. This is another instance of repurposing precious heirlooms. And Fran Hildebrandt has a beautiful hand embroidered matzah cover that has stitched into it the date of 1891. It's not from her family. It was purchased at a rummage sale by someone who didn't know what it was and who eventually gifted it to Fran. It has become a prized family object that has influenced her satyrs and her family. She gives thanks each time she uses it and sees it to the nameless crafter who has created a new family heirloom for the Hildebrands. The path to creating family heirlooms can be very different, but always meaningful. If you create a meaningful tradition around it, the ideas are endless. And if you are not crafty or creative, there are many vendors and artists who will do it for you. They will take your ideas and create beautiful new heirlooms for generations to come to enjoy. I hope tonight's session has given you lots of ideas and the motivation to make them reality. Finally, the most important thing you can do now to preserve your family history is to teach your family about their past and invest them in preserving it with you. When your family cares about their history, they will make good decisions for the coming generations. Make it fun and interesting. Make it part of your lifestyle today and your legacy will be well-preserved. 
So what's next? Oh, is there another slide? There you go. Sorry about that. Um, all who are, are registered for or attended tonight's session will receive will receive um, a short Google form survey to tell us what you want and if you found the session valuable. And if you would like, and you indicate so, we'll send you an heirlooms tips and resources handout with useful information and links to some helpful articles. I have also prepared a document with pictures, the stories and contact information for many of the wonderful creative Judaic heirlooms just presented included with the vendors they use to help create them. And please save the date for, for our sixth How to Live Forever session on Thursdays, December 16th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. The session will be devoted to learning about unique and creative ways of presenting and sharing your family's story. I hope that many of you will want to share how you plan to pass on your family archives. There are so many ways, please share yours. There will be places on the survey that you can indicate you would like to be contacted. I hope tonight's program has motivated and enthused you to start collecting, caring for, writing down the stories and even creating new family heirlooms. It is an incredible journey to live forever through your story. One that benefits you as the storyteller and collector. It is also a priceless gift to your family and future generations. The gift of better knowing who they are because they understand where they come from. So go and do and enjoy. We are now going to open the chat box and Carol Simon will look for your questions. Um, let's end the, there you go. So Carol, um, do you have a question before yeah. we get any? Okay, thank you. Okay. No question so far, but I'll ask you the question I've asked you before. I have many pieces of Lennox serving pieces. They were my mother-in-law's. I can't find any place that wants them. No antique store, no thrift shop. So what do you do with those pieces, Corey? Oh, an easy question to start with, right? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you can do is you can, um, you can make a collection of them. Um, I would probably, uh, you know, the value of a piece when it's purchased is not the value of the piece when you want to give it away. Um, and as I said before, China is not something that, that is a value, uh, a pop popular heirloom. I would first go to your children and your grandchildren and ask them what pieces they would like. And you may not be able to give the set to anybody, but how cool would it be to, for a cup and a saucer to each grandchild? Um, maybe you wanna put a plant in it. Oh, or maybe you wanna, or maybe you want to, um, maybe you want to put it into a shadow box with a picture of your mother, uh, like you saw with the jewelry. Um, you can do that. There are many uh, creative things that you can do with that china. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Um, uh, Stan and I had a, uh, my husband and I had a business and um, we had a, a staff room uh, that had silverware and stuff in it for its staff to use. I didn't like to use plastic because it's not good for the in, uh, environment. So we had regular silverware. Of course, it wasn't kosher. Anybody could bring their stuff in. And um, so I decided to go into um, uh, the Salvation Army store to see if I, because every it seemed like for, forks were just, they disappeared. So I went into the Salvation Army store and um, to look for forks, because I figured that would be great. I didn't want to pay a lot of money for them because they do disappear. So I'm walking in and Stan says to me, hey, Cor, isn't that your mother's china? On a little table at the beginning of the store was a, a whole bunch of china as accessories and so on and so forth that were this, not only the same pattern, but the same color as my mother's china. 
somebody, it was Villaroy and Box, so it was expensive. And somebody had given it away because nobody wanted it. Uh, we ended up buying um, and koshering uh, by not using it for several years, um, the china uh, for, an, for my daughter-in-law who now had the china and was using it for family occasions. Um, but it, was, it just points out that, you know, sometimes you just have to give it away, but maybe you can break it up and give pieces to people who want it or save it for people who want it. Maybe there's a, an accessory that, um, uh, that are interesting and just mark it for each, but make sure you tell the story and who it belonged to and a little bit about that person. All right, thank you. All right, so now we have a couple of real questions. <laughs> uh, that was not a real question. Oh no, it was a real question. When you're down here, you'll see I have two tables set up with Lennox serving pieces. <laughs> okay, so Cheryl um, Kalman is ask, asking, you mentioned not wearing textiles. What about Tali Tote? Um, for me, I would wear them. I mean, what are you, um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about Tali Tote uh, since I run the, the weaving program. Wear them, and if you wear them out, that's fine. But not all of that piece of fabric will be worn out. And you, uh, what I, when we make Tali Tote, we've had many instances where someone will take a piece of fabric, maybe the atara, the neck piece, or one of the corner reinforcements and put it in a new Tali. Um, and and um, so they have a piece of whoever's it was on there. Uh, the other thing about Tali Tote is, uh, you know, of course, and Rabbi, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, of course, that um, when a Tahara, when somebody dies, a man dies, and now a woman as well, if that, if that happened, um, uh, the man is buried in a, in a shroud, and they have a Tali uh, many people are not aware of the fact that um, it is not necessary to bury the person in their talit that they wore forever. And in fact, I would encourage you not to do that. That talit is an heirloom, and you want to save that for future generations. The, the uh, group that performs the tahara uh, in the tahara kit, many times there is a talit for, for a male or a female. Um, that has no sentimental value. Um, and I would encourage you to consider not burying somebody in the talit they wore forever, but using it as an heirloom to pass on. Your choice, my feeling, and I share it. Okay, so I'll just add on to that before we go to the next question. I have my father's talit. Um, I needle pointed a atara for me. I made sure that they put it on top that they didn't, that. I, the one that that's around my neck, and I finished the needle point for his post um, yurt site, and it's really meaningful. So, Thank and you. then I took my very first talit and gave it to my granddaughter for her bat mitzvah. Oh, okay, lovely. so we have a few other questions. Um, Anita Slade is asking, I have gold trim, beautiful china, and also two sterling silver sets of silverware. Nobody wants them. What do I do? Um, what you, you do is if you want, um, you can take, if you can uh, I break it up, um, I take some pieces from the silverware and some pieces of the china, as I've spoken to Carol, um, and use that, give that away. Uh, somebody will be much more, uh, much more eager to take one accessory. Uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, 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 a salad set from your sterling, the, the sterling silver uh, set uh, to give them. So they, because people don't want it today. They really don't want it. Melt it down and, and buy something um, for yourself, for them, whatever. But keep some of the pieces. The, you know, the whole set, if, if, if sterling silverware was something that was really valued and wanted and people cared about cleaning it, that's one thing. But you saw, I, I think you saw, I showed a picture of the, the sterling silver pieces that um, my mom had framed from and, had, and is on display. And I think that that will go on. I mean, nobody has to take care of it. It's not gonna be used. It's not a burden. So maybe you wanna do that with some of it. 
Okay, I, thanks, Corey. We have a few more. Um, so Cheryl Kalman said that she actually made a talit from an Israeli shawl from that her mother made. And Margie Furman has a question. Whoops, let me find it. I just lost it. Um, is a will an appropriate place to talk about heirlooms as you bequeath it? Sure, why not? Uh, it is, and as, and as I said before in, in the presentation, you can give them away in the will um, or you can give them before. Uh, easy to give them away in the will because you're not around to, to get any arguments. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the most important thing, I think, uh, if you can do it, is to really ask people what they want uh, so that they get what they want. Um, right. My mom's round robin really worked well. And, you know, uh, my, we did it by age. I'm the middle child. And uh, the first piece that I asked for, uh, any piece, was a pin. My mother had a lot of jewelry. Uh, was a pin that had a picture of my mom in it that her mother wore. And my mom was a child at the time. But that was the, it wasn't worth a lot. I don't even think it's 14 carat. And the, the jewels around the pin are probably semi-precious. There's no diamonds or anything, but it was the most meaningful to me because my mother wore a picture. My grandmother wore that pin with a picture of her daughter, her youngest child on it and then gave it to my mom who wore that pin. And now I have it. Um, and any time that I wanna take my mom with me at a special occasion, I make sure that I wear that pin. Um, my youngest granddaughter is named after my mother and she will get that pin. Her name is Naomi and the pin in my mom's name was Naomi. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, Marjorie also commented that they used her father's talit as the canopy for their son's wedding. Um, and Anita Slade had another question. She, she said, I also have antiques and dishes I know are valuable, but I don't, don't know how to find out their value and how to dispose of them because nobody wants these valuables. You're right. And I, I don't know how to, I don't know that. I mean, some people I know try and sell them on eBay. Um, that's a whole skill set that I don't have. Um, or going to, uh, you may want to contact a couple of antique dealers and see uh, what suggestions they have. This is not, these things are not great value today. They just aren't. Um, and you're not going to get, don't. So my own personal philosophy, right or wrong, but it's my philosophy, is regarding things. Um, the things are only as valuable as people who want them or what they mean to you. Um, I've got a lot of sterling, a lot of sterling. My mother's family was in the jewelry business. I've got three sets of sterling silver flatware. Um, it's not valuable. Um, I will take out the pieces that are meaningful to me and the rest of it will melt down and I'll buy bond, Israeli bonds for the kids or something. Um, but if it has meaning, that's the value of it. It's not the monetary value. And I, I think that goes for anything. Um, really decide what value means. Uh, is it, you know, you wanna get money out of it, then melt it down. You're never gonna get, I don't believe, um, in very few things will give you the amount of money that you paid for them or somebody else paid for them. Okay, so we have a, not a question, a statement from, I don't, M-V-T-U-L. She just wrote, who wants my crystal? <laughs> Thought I would share that. Okay, and- uh, well, Andrew, let, me just, I, let me just make a comment. Um, uh, my mother loved, had a set of crystal that she started when she went to Sweden with my dad. Um, and for our anniversaries, we would buy her extra place settings so that she ended up with 18 place settings of crystal glassware. Well, who wants it? Nobody wanted it. Aha, she gave it to me. So there was, there was an auction. Uh, one of the charities in, in where we lived in Harrisburg had a wine auction each year and they had a silent auction. And so I donated the whole thing <laughs> to that, that silent auction and they sold it. Uh, it had no value to me and I didn't want it. 
I kept, I, I did keep the decanter, which is very pretty. And it, it, it was, that was the heirloom from that set. And that there's the story that will go. And I will tell, you know, the story will, will say about what happened to the rest of this crystal because I'm not hand washing that crystal. And I don't think anybody else wants to. So that's what happened is I donated it. Okay, and Andrea Heiger, um, not a question, just a comment. She wrote, I, I was the recipient of my grandmother's best friend's cup and saucer. I love them because I remember them in her breakfast, in her break front. Um, and Jeanette Brownstein said, both of my children and their fiancés walked down the aisle for their ufrofs under my grandfather's tali, their great-grandfather. Um, Sheila Kaufman, it's from... Oh, Helene Tyler and one from Elaine Klein. Sheila? Okay. Um, okay. Helene Tyler wrote, I have created an heirloom photo album with birth certificates, marriage license, immigration papers, etc. I want to attach an army metal discharge piece. How can I attach it to the album? The pages are made out of photo paper. Um, so what I would suggest is that you put the album in a box. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can attach it to the album. I wouldn't use glue. I, I don't, you can ask, a, um, you can go online and do some research, but glue is something that you have to really be careful about because it will destroy items. Um, and I would probably put it, the album and, and the, a box with the metal in it, uh, in a box. And then make sure you lay in an acid-free box and make sure that you label exactly what's in there um, and, and put the story of everything that you've got in there on it. Um, uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing in that last session, and we're going to need your help to do it, is uh, we're going to be telling, uh, identifying ways to pass your story on. Um, remembering that, that when we, the July session on documents and photos, the, one of the words was be careful because uh, not everybody's gonna wanna take that 10 pound wedding album, right? We all have that with, or not all of us, but many of us have that 10 pound wedding album that has 24 or 30 pictures in it, but it's huge. And nobody's gonna wanna carry that from generation to generation. So we're gonna talk about what you can do with that wedding album, uh, with the pictures anyway. Um, so we have to be cognizant of what, what we can do with that stuff and who's going to take care of it. Okay. The other question is from Elaine Klein. I have a small ornate silver bowl that was made for my husband's aunt out of silver coins so she could take the money out of Germany. It is, better to, is it better to give to a family member or contact a Holocaust museum? If a family member wants it, um, perhaps you want to do that. Or if you want to make it available to more, I mean, that's a very special thing in, in my mind, um, then contact a museum or a Holocaust museum. Um, donating, donating heirlooms uh, items is a, is a way to go. And we talked about that a little bit in other sessions. But um, it's really a matter of personal choice. It's, it, it's best the way you want to do it. If you want to keep it in the family, um, literally keep it in the family, then donate it to a family member. If you want to make it more available to others, then donate it to the museum or to, the, to whatever, the organization. Okay, Corey, um, Marjorie Furman had a comment. She said, there are books that will give you values. Um, this was answering the question before. Also, areas have local clubs of specific collectibles. Check with these sources as to value. Um, sh she said she collects dishes and that's what she does. Um, there's also one from uh, Melinda, she said her mother was a great knitter, baby children, sweaters, beautiful baby blankets. What do I do with them when my grandchildren no longer use them? Save them for your great grandchildren. Um, and write I the have, story. <laughs> I, I have uh, my mother when she was pregnant with my brother, her old, her first child, uh, knit a uh, sweater, which I have. And she also handmade a, the Brit dress. And uh, I have both of those things and they will be passed on. 
to the family. And if they use them, fine. If they don't, okay. If you give heirlooms away that you think have meaning and will have meaning to future generations, and that's really, you know, those questions that I talked about at the, uh, toward the beginning, you have to ask those questions. I would make sure that you digitize those heirlooms. At least take a picture of them and print the picture. You can also have them electronic, but print the picture because the electronics will change. The technology will change. On the back of that picture, write with a, um, a fine Sharpie the story of the item, exactly what it is. And at least if you're gonna give it away or if it gets ruined or there's a flood or a fire or whatever, you'll have some memory of that thing. I, I, it's really important. Sometimes it's, you can't keep the item because nobody wants to or because it's ruined. But at least if you take good pictures and good pictures can be with a cell phone, uh, you'll be able to use that um, as part of your, the heirlooms you pass on. Second best, of course, but that's what it, what happens. Okay, two comments, one from Cindy Martyr. She, so, she said, my oldest son and his wife were married under a chuppah made with her mother's wedding dress, and which is always nice. And Barbara Weiss, hi, Barbara. Um, she wrote, my father's ties is a book that was a wonderful source for my family. My sister Gail made pillows and my sister Roberta wrap, um, wrapped picture frames of my father with his ties. Oh, nice. Nice story, Barbara. There are, there are lots of ways you can create heirlooms, lots of ways and lots of ways that you can take heirlooms from the past as, as has been mentioned and, and make them part of your family. The point is, that you have lots and lots of heirlooms and that how many of you and, and let's raise hands how many of you have heirlooms from your parents or grandparents everybody yeah. no not everybody actually not everybody and how many of you want to pass those on to others yeah so if you don't do anything today to do that it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. So you're responsible for not, if you don't have the heirlooms you wanted from your parents, your grandparents, your great, great, great grandparents, don't make generations to come be in the same situation and tell the stories. Okay. If you don't know a lot, tell as much as you know. I, I'm Shira. Um, has her hand up. I don't, can you unmute yourself, Shira, so you can answer your question? I don't know. Where... Sorry, that was in response to the, you know, how many people have heirlooms. That was oh, okay. Question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See, tech, technology is great. <laughs> okay. I don't have any further um, questions or comments. Okay, so um, let me just say that, um, please. So Sherry physically has her hand up. Oh, Sherry, go ahead, please. Okay, I, I arrived late and I, I sent a, a, tech, a chat to whoever, but it was not you, Carol. We have actually gotten some replacements. Uh, pieces that we had through replacements unlimited and I don't know where they are offhand but uh, then we've kept them for a while before we use them because we do keep kosher and then also we get information from Silver Queen which I believe is in Florida and they buy and sell uh, sterling silver. So Sherry Sherry, would you please send me that, email me that information and I'll put it on the resource machine, in the resource list. I would be glad to. That's great. Okay, um, I, I can't see who that is, who got MV Toe? It's Marion. Oh, um, Marion. Oh, okay, hi. I, no, I got a new, I got a new computer and my son-in-law couldn't seem to put more than that. <laughs> what I was going to say is that I have been giving items away that my children want so I'm enjoying when I go to their homes, seeing them now rather than waiting till 
I'm long gone, I, I really find that wonderful because when my daughter brings out some of my plates and put, you know, for cake or coffee or whatever, it reminds me of where I, when I bought them and what they are and she knows about it. So I do believe in giving stuff away while you're alive. I really do. Not I to do. keep everything. You know, if somebody wants something now, I'm a firm believer, fine, take it right now and enjoy. Um, I've also started giving um, away my jewelry uh, for birthdays, Hanukkah, special occasions. Uh, Marjorie. Um, I was just going to say something else on the same subject I was talking about before about values. Another way to get, get to uh, give away dishes and other like kitchen equipment and other kinds of things, frames, farm tools, whatever, look for local house museums. I was a trustee at the Suffolk County Vanderbilt Museum for about 20 years. We gratefully accepted any donations of period dishes, glasses. Somebody gave us a tractor. We took it because house museums, which are not for profits generally, you need to check. They will give you a letter for taxes and um, it, you can go visit your stuff. I, Whenever I'm on Long Island, I go visit my grandmother's meat grinder, which is now installed in Willie K. Vanderbilt's servant's kitchen, among nice. other things. When I moved to Maryland, I had to get rid of 20 sets of dishes. It killed me. I was only allowed to bring down, I think, 15. So I, I gave a lot of them to local house museums. I gave them to friends. Don't ever forget you have friends. And friends might be more willing to take things than grandchildren because they knew you. And then it's their problem to get rid of them in the next generation. Marjorie, write that, write about the house museums up and send it to me, please. I will. Thank I'm you. Happy to. Thank I don't you. know about house museums where I live now, but I can tell you all about Long Island. Well, just generally then what they okay. are. Okay, I'll do what I can. Thank you so much. Um, any other comments? Who's going to go and make stories about Susan their Hackerman has story? Her hand up too. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Hi. I did send something in the chat, and no one has read what I sent. Please. So, if you how about you tell us? Okay. So what it is? Um, we were talking about trying to figure out what to do with silver and items of that sort. Um, I inherited an entire set of silver. It wasn't sterling silver, but it was platters and all kinds of you know large items and I had it appraised I'm sorry appraised and um they said you're just not going to get much for it so I'm thinking okay what do you recommend that I do with it and they said well just ask around see who possibly might be able to use what it is that you have to offer and I did talk to um someone at our synagogue and they said bring it I took it and had somebody else help me. And this was pre-COVID because we had um, polishing parties where women said, let's just sit down, let's chat, let's polish whatever it was. It wasn't, you know, silverware per se. It was big, large items that um, they could use for not just our sisterhood functions, but also for the congregation's functions. And I would say it was a win for me because I was able to part with it. And it was a win for the synagogue because it's something that they were gonna use. Now I'm sure time being what it is, it's somewhere in some closet in um, the synagogue, but hopefully uh, at some point they'll pull it out. Maybe if it needs to be done, the sisterhood will agree to do it again. If not, they'll figure out what they're gonna do with it. But it was not something you know I wanted to hold on to, and I'm glad that they were able to use it for the time period that they had. So, Super. thank you, Susan. Um, sure. Is Heike is Heike on? Heike, are you on? I don't know if she is on or not. Mm, I don't know. She she's I, okay. She's a really yes. I have two more comments. One sure. from Karen Weiner. She said, I met a craftsperson at a green market who made bracelets out of spoons. So I did that with my sterling silver spoons 
for, my, for her daughters. And Meryl, um, Nadell said, refugees currently being resettled may be able to use China and silverware. Good point. That is really good point. Yeah, and you know what? I've seen uh, jewelry bracelets made out of forks too. Mm -hmm. um, so isn't that, wouldn't that be fun to take, you know, take all, you know, how, I don't know how many granddaughters or daughters you have or daughters-in-law and make one for each of them. I mean, that would be fun. Yeah. A nice Hanukkah gift. I like that. Any other questions or, or ideas to share? Okay. Uh, Amy, Amy has her hand Amy. up. Oh, Amy, okay, thank you. Hi, how you doing, Corey? Um, Hi. Great. Uh, very much along the line of what you spoke about, that you're giving away your jewelry uh, to your children and grandchildren now. Uh, I remember when my, after my mother had passed away and she had not a lot, but certainly significant pieces of gold jewelry. And they were mostly bracelets. Uh, so, you know, pins come and go, but bracelets, I mean, you can wear five bracelets on one arm. So um, anyway, I gave them uh, th the three of the nicest pieces I gave to uh, my two daughters and a daughter-in-law. And uh, they, they wear them and they love them and they know they came from my mother. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very significant gift. Super, super. And, and remember the picture that I also showed of the buttons? Yes. Um, and the watches uh, that's, you know, I ha how many of us have watches in our drawers that don't work and we, you know, we've worn them, they might even be gold, whatever. Um, so they're a great, they're a great gift. They're an heirloom gift. Um, okay. Any other comments? Yeah. Corey, um, Rabbi has her hand up. Rabbi? You're muted. Yeah, you I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share that when I was 16 and my father's mother was almost passing, she was still there with us, but she died like two months later. So I was 16, my sister's four and a half years older, and she took apart her charm bracelet, which was amazing because she was a very simple woman. So I don't know when she ever wore it. But for my sister, she gave her a charm that was a doctor's bag with a stethoscope in it. So my sister was 21. She's a neurologist today. And for me, she gave one that was like an Aron Kodesh, the Ark and the, the yeah. Ark. And it opens with a Torah inside. And I was just like, the woman was like a Nivea. She was a prophetess that like figured out. And I remember I wore that necklace to my rabbinical school interview. I think I wore it for my ordination. Like I hardly ever wear the charm, but it was just like how she knew that what her granddaughters were going to be doing. And how meaningful that we didn't have to wait till after she died to get it. It was it was just incredible. That's lovely. That is lovely. Yeah. Um, gives me this. And shoot. Corey, this was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. So the next session um, it will be on December sixteenth, and probably the last in this How to Live Forever series. Um, uh, and it's going to, uh, what we want, I want to do is, is have people sh have, share how people pass on their story. Um, I've got lots of different ways to do it, but, uh, and I can present lots of different ways to do it from my research and from stuff that I've all already done, but I would like to get your, your ways that you're sharing your story. Uh, you come on here, you, which means that you value sharing your story and you want to live forever. So tell me how you plan to do that or how you um, have done it in part. And uh, so I, the survey will give you a place to say, yeah, contact me. And that's what we hope to do is really have a good session on so we can share ideas uh, of how people are doing it or plan to do it. So put December 16th on your calendars and of course, don't hesitate to call if you want to have any questions or if you want to share uh, any information. And those of you who've given ideas of what you've been doing with some of your heirlooms, please let me know it because we're going to send out that heirloom resource sheet next week. And I want to include that with it. Um, so thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. It's been just joyful for me to do the research on this. Just know that I'm not an expert. I Google everything and I've just had this love for it for years. And I think you do too. So use that love to do something and to share you who you are through your heirlooms with the next generation. Thank you for coming.
Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom to everybody. Shabbat shalom.